we think of sex and gender as something to do with women and it's not it's to do with humans you know there are two sexes <laughs> there are men and there are women um, and so this is about men too and the sex disaggregated data is important for men as well as women um because you know men are the ones who are most likely to die from this and we need to know why that is So, Caroline, in your book, you described how a lot of equipment and uniforms are designed around male body sizes and proportions. And I suppose that's become very important now. Yeah, I mean, I think most people will have seen the headlines, the really shocking headlines going around around the world about how we simply don't have enough PPE to protect the frontline staff. And of course, that's not just health workers. You know, that's also people like the cleaners who are going into the ITU. You know, they need uh, protective equipment as well. Um, and that is a huge problem, but a problem that is longer existing than that and continues to be of great concern is that the vast majority of personal protective equipment um, has been designed to fit the male body. So when you have, for example, small, that's actually small for men rather than small for women or just average for women. Um, and that's particularly an acute problem in this context, because the majority of healthcare workers are female. Um, I think it's 77% of NHS workers are female. That's 89% of nurses. Of course, bear in mind, nurses are the ones who are really doing the intimate uh, bodily work often. And they get told things like, oh, your face is a weird shape. Well, it's not a weird shape. It's a female <laughs> shape, you know. Um, and, and we're not just talking about masks, of course. It's also things like gloves being too big, which can be a serious problem if you're trying to do, um, to do intubation let's let's say and that is a very dangerous procedure in this disease because if you get that wrong and um, then you will get aerosolized uh, virus particles up in the air um, and as we know one of the really dangerous um, points for this virus is if you get a high viral load and certainly in stats that we have from Italy, uh, one in 10 of those who were contracting a serious case of COVID-19 were healthcare workers. And what was also shocking about those statistics was that um, while in the general population, 60% of those who had COVID-19 were men, um, amongst the healthcare workers, 65% were women, you know, reflecting the fact that this is a female dominated workforce and of course also that they're not being properly protected. There have been at least two nurses, one in New York uh, and one in the UK, both of whom felt that they had to quit their jobs because the PPE would not fit their bodies and they bought their own PPE so that they could carry on doing their life-saving work that they want to do, but they want to be able to do it without getting sick, which is absolutely right. Um, and they were told that they weren't allowed to. So there's just a total lack of common sense as well, um, because also that shows that there probably is some PPE out there and it probably is harder to source and maybe it costs a bit more because we haven't been producing it, but there is some PPE that will potentially fit women's bodies. Why aren't we buying it? Why as well are we not talking about this? When we're talking about the fact that there are PPE shortages, we should also be talking about the fact that the majority female workforce are particularly badly off here. And this is a, an issue for beyond the workforce. You know, if you want to think of it from a sort of selfish perspective, if you get sick, you don't want half the workforce to be off sick. Um, you know, the workforce who are potentially going to be treating you simply because we didn't buy adequate PPE for them. Yeah. So looking at this medical response to coronavirus, I've seen you tweeting about the fact that nurses who do uh, tend to be, there are more women in that profession, are sometimes being overlooked when we're talking about the wonderful medical response that we are seeing. Uh, are you referring to the Matt Hancock? <laughs> yes, um, I believe Matt. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, he he uh, was on Question Time, I believe, um, with I think it was the head of the Royal College of Nursing, um, and he said four doctors have died and some nurses. And she pointed out that the reason he wasn't able to say, you know, give a number, uh, was that the numbers of nurses were not being counted, um, and that is shocking and appalling and I and I can't account for that I, I can't understand why we wouldn't be counting the numbers of nurses who have died from this disease you know while they're doing their job I mean I, I wouldn't think that it's a deliberate decision it's just sort of an oversight but actually that's something that we're seeing a lot in all sorts of parts of the response is that 
issues that are relevant to women's lives are kind of being overlooked. So if you go back to the PPE, you know, we're talking about the fact that um, there are PPE shortages, but we're not talking about the fact that actually women um, are suffering anyway, even if there weren't shortages, there would be problems for women because we don't have PPE that fits their bodies. Um, and similarly, there have been other sort of uh, policy responses um, where there have been these gender gaps because the people who are um, coming up with the policy aren't necessarily thinking of the way that men and women might have differing needs. So, for example, when the lockdown was announced um, and children were sent home from school, uh, apart from the children of key workers, it wasn't made clear uh, whether or not domestic violence workers were included in key workers. They absolutely need to be because anyone who knows anything about gender would tell you that we we knew that domestic violence was going to go up during the lockdown. Domestic violence always goes up in a crisis situation. Domestic violence always goes up uh, when people feel that they are losing control over their lives. Um, and it's just also common sense that if you are locking people up together with their abusers and not giving them means to escape, that domestic violence will go up. And indeed, that is what we've seen across the world. Most people are hardly leaving their homes as instructed, apart from uh, to go out to get food or exercise or those other few exceptions that we're allowed. And there's a, a lot of debate on social media um, about how strict we should be on this. Mm -hmm. And you, uh, you've said there's a, sometimes an element of sexism to this, haven't you? Well, again, it's not thinking about the people whose lives may not be the same as your life. Um, so it's sexism and it's also classism. Um, because the reality is that if you have uh, a house with a garden, Lockdown is not the same for you as someone who has a tiny basement flat with barely any natural light and no garden and lives uh, with their abuser. Um, not being able to go out for them is a much more serious issue. Um, it's a more serious mental and physical health issue. And similarly, you know, some people don't even have their own flat. You know, you've got people living in hostels, whole families in one room, sharing bathrooms and kitchens with other families where social distancing is impossible. If we were to say that they were not allowed to go out of the house, you know, the, the impact would be completely disproportionate for children who are having to live in these conditions. Um, and of course, that's really where the sexism comes in as well. It's not just about domestic violence. It's also about the fact that women are the ones who tend to be in charge of the children. Women do the majority of childcare in this country and around the world, the majority of uh, domestic work. Um, and so when you send children home from school, uh, when you tell parents that they're not allowed to let their kids out to run around in a park for an hour to let off some steam, it tends to be the women who are going to be most affected by those rulings. And that's not necessarily to say that I think that lockdown shouldn't happen. I, I think it clearly needs to happen, but it's the way that it is done um, and the resources that you put in to making sure that the impact on certain groups of people who are the most vulnerable are not disproportionate. And, you know, I think back again to this issue of what about that woman who is living with an abusive partner who sees it as her job to keep the kids quiet and she can't keep the kids quiet because she isn't, you know, they're not able to get out and run off all their pent up energy um, because they're only allowed to run, you know, on a jog, which is never gonna happen for a toddler. So it just feels like this is policy being designed by people who just aren't thinking about the various different experiences um, that people living in their borough will have. If we turn now to a different kind of bias, um, coronavirus seems to have a sex bias, uh, but against men, um, in that men do seem to be dying at a slightly higher rate from this virus. Mm -hmm. Of course, that doesn't mean women are safe, but it is a curiosity, that slightly higher rate. Slightly higher rate. What do you make of that? One of the things that's been really frustrating um, about watching the global response to this has been that the world seems to be getting this very sharp, lesson in the fact that collecting sex disaggregated data really does matter um, because there are sex specific responses to all sorts of diseases. And you would hope that seeing this death rate differing so starkly by sex um, would encourage governments um, to really start 
being serious about collecting systematically sex disaggregated data and publishing that data. And we're just not seeing that. Some countries are being great um, and are publishing all that data. Some countries are publishing a bit of data. The UK is very much uh, lagging behind, as is the US. Um, and we need to know these things. You know, we need to know, for example, are more men dying because more men are getting it? You know, which at that point, that might be something to do with gender. You know, all the studies coming out suggesting that men are less likely to wash their hands, less likely to engage in social distancing. Um, or is there something uh, biological going on? Now, in my in my book, Invisible Women, I did write about this briefly, about the female immune system being more active than the male immune system. Um, that can uh, be a problem for women in that it means that women uh, make up 80% of those who have autoimmune diseases. Um, but it's potential that in this scenario, it is one of the reasons that women are being more likely to survive uh, COVID-19. Um, but what's really frustrating about it is that we know so little about the female immune system, because part of the reason that we don't tend to collect sex disaggregated data isn't that we're collecting data on men and women and just not dividing it up by sex. It's that we're generally collecting data on men um, and assuming that that will just work for both sexes. But imagine if we had done that research and we fully understood how the female immune system worked and potentially we would be able to help um, some of the men who are really tragically dying well before their time. The, I mean, I can see that there's been a historical neglect, but isn't some of it for understandable reasons? So in human studies, um, there's been fear that if we give experimental drugs to a woman who might be pregnant, it could have consequences for the fetus. Absolutely. Um, and so what needs to happen is that women need to be given that information so that they can make an informed decision rather than the approach that has been taken historically of uh, nannying women and saying, oh, well, you might get pregnant and therefore uh, we're going to protect you. Now, and this can have absolutely tragic consequences. So in the Ebola outbreak, um, what happened was that pregnant women were not allowed to take part in vaccine trials, were not allowed to take part in clinical drug trials, and actually weren't allowed to receive the drugs or the vaccines, um, simply on the basis of they're pregnant and pregnant women are never included. But actually, there was an incredibly high death rate uh, for women who were pregnant with Ebola. I think it was something like 90%. And so at that point, you have to start thinking, maybe this risk is worth it. And maybe at least we should give the women the facts and say, look, we don't know how this will affect you and your baby. But if you don't try it, the likelihood is, you know, huge likelihood is you're going to die. So you're campaigning now for the, um, for the UK as it collects uh, data on coronavirus infections to break down the data by sex, aren't you? Mm -hmm. I mean, do, do you think some people might say, hang on, we're in the middle of a pandemic here, we don't have time for worrying about sexual discrimination, that's a first world problem. Um, I don't have to think some people are, I know they are, they literally have said it, <laughs> um, including someone's MP who replied to her request that he speak to uh, the Department for Health uh, about why the NHS hasn't included sex as a data point in their um, in their online survey. And he basically said, uh, go away, I've got more important things to worry about. So yes, of course that's happening. And that always happens. It always happens that in the midst of a pandemic or crisis, disease outbreak, war, whatever it is, we decide sex doesn't matter anymore. Um, and there's a, a number of reasons for that. One is that we think of sex and gender as something to do with women. And it's not. It's to do with humans. You know, there are two sexes. <laughs> there are men and there are women. Um, and so this is about men, too. And the sex disaggregated data is important for men as well as women, um, because, you know, men are the ones who are most likely to die from this. And we need to know why that is. And if we're going to be able to know accurately why that is, we need to have the data that is showing what the difference is really are. So to conclude, uh, I wonder if there might be any silver linings to this pandemic. Uh, it's not something anyone would have wished for, but do you think it might lead to longer lasting societal changes that could in the end be positive? I mean, I really hope so. You, you have to hope, don't you? Um, and, and I suppose the obvious one is that I really hope that it will 
help people understand more why sex disaggregated data matters, why we need to study women as well as men, um, because the gaps in our knowledge that this pandemic has highlighted um, are pretty substantial. Um, and I think it's made it real for a lot of people. And obviously it's awful that this has happened, but let's try and make it not all be for nothing. Um, thank you very much for doing the interview, Caroline. It was really interesting. Um, great to talk to you. Um, I hope I can talk to you again in future uh, when this is all over. Great. Goodbye. Well, thank you very much. Bye bye.